story fifteen of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story fifteen grump's pet on a certain day in november eighteen fifty there meandered into the new mining camp of painter bar state of california an individual who was instantly pronounced all voices concurring the ugliest man in the camp the adjective ugly was applied to the man's physiognomy alone but time soon gave the word as applied to him a far wider significance in fact the word was not at all equal to the requirements made of it and this was probably what influenced the prefixing of numerous adjectives sacred and profane to this little word of four letters the individual in question stated that he came from no war in particular and the savage furtive glance that shot from his hyena-like eyes seemed to plainly indicate why the land of his origin was so indefinitely located a badly broken nose failed to soften the expression of his eyes a long prominent dull red scar divided one of his cheeks his moustache was not heavy enough to hide a hideous hair lip while a ragged beard and a head of stiff bristly red hair formed a setting which intensified rather than embellished the peculiarities we have noted the first settlers who seemed quite venerable and dignified now that the camp was nearly a fortnight old were in the habit of extending hospitality to all newcomers until these latter could build huts for themselves but no one hastened to invite this beauty to partake of cracker pork and lodging-place and he finally betook himself to the southerly side of a large rock against which he placed a few boughs to break the wind the morning after his arrival certain men missed provisions and the ugly man was suspected but so depressing as one miner mildly put it was his aspect when even looked at inquiringly that the bravest of the boys found excuse for not asking questions of the suspected man ain't got no chum suggested bozen an ex-sailor one day after the crowd had done considerable staring at this unpleasant object ain't got no chum and's lonesome needs a cheerin up so bozen philanthropically staked a new claim near the stranger apart from the main party the next morning found him back on his old claim and volunteering to every one the information that stranger's a grump a regular grump from that time forth grump was the only name by which the man was known time rolled on and in the course of a month painter bar was mentioned as an old camp it had its mining rules its saloon blacksmith shop and faro bank like the proudest camp on the run and one could find there colonels judges doctors and squires by the dozen besides one deacon and a domine or two still the old inhabitants kept an open eye for newcomers and displayed an open-hearted friendliness from whose example certain eastern cities might profit but on one particular afternoon the estimable reception committee were put to their wits end they were enjoying their otium cum dignitale on a rude bench in front of the saloon when some one called attention to an unfamiliar form which leaned against a stunted tree a few rods off it was of a short loose-jointed young man who seemed so thin and lean that black tom ventured the opinion that that there feller had better hold tight to the ground to keep from fallin upwards his eyes were colourless his nose was enormous his mouth hung wide open and then shut with a twitch as if its owner were eating flies his chin seemed to have been entirely forgotten and his thin hair was in colour somewhere between sand and mud as he leaned against the tree he afforded a fine opportunity for the study of acute and obtuse angles his neck shoulders elbows wrists back knees and feet all described angles and even the toes of his shocking boots deflected from the horizontal in a most decided manner somebody ought to go say something to him said the colonel who was recognized as leader by the miners fact colonel replied one of the men but what's a feller to say to such a meanderin boneyard as that might ask him for politeness sake to take a first pick of lots in a new burying ground but him perkins died last week you know 
say something somebody commanded the colonel and as he spoke his eyes alighted on slim sam who obediently stepped out to greet the newcomer mister said sam producing a plug of tobacco have a jaw i don't use tobacco languidly replied the man and his answer was so unexpected that sam precipitately retired then black tom advanced and pleasantly asked what's your favorite game stranger blind man's buff replied the stranger what's that inquired tom blushing with shame at being compelled to display ignorance about games anything like going up blind at poker poker i don't know what that is replied the youth he's from the country said the colonel compassionately and hasn't had the right schoolin'. perhaps continued the colonel he'd enjoyed a cockfight at the saloon to-night these country boys are pretty well up on roosters ask him tom tom put the question and the party in deep disgust heard the man reply oh, no thank you i think it's cruel to make the poor birds hurt each other look here said the good-natured bosun the poor lover's all gone in amidships see how flat his bread-basket is i say messmate continued bosun with a roar and a jerk of his thumb over his shoulder come and splice the main brace no thank you answered the unreasonable stranger i don't drink the boys looked incredulously at each other while the colonel arose and paced the front of the saloon two or three times looking greatly puzzled he finally stopped and said the miserable rat isn't fit to be out of doors and needs taken care of come here feller called the colonel be kinder sociable don't stand there a gawpin at us as if we was a menagerie the youth approached slowly stared through the crowd and finally asked is there any one here from pawkin center no one responded some men went out to californy from pawkin center and i didn't know but some of em was here i come from there myself my name's mix the youth continued meanin no disrespect to your dad said the colonel mr mix senior oughtn't to have let you come out here you ain't strong enough you'll get fever and agur before you wash dirt half a day i ain't got no dad replied the stranger leastways he ran away ten years ago and mother had a powerful hard time since a bringin up the young uns and we thought i might help along a big sight if i was out here the colonel was not what in the states would be called a prayer-meeting man but he looked steadily at the young man and inwardly breathed a very earnest god have mercy on you all then he came back to the more immediate present and looking about asked who's got sleeping room for this young man i have quickly answered grump who had approached unnoticed while the newcomer was being interviewed everyone started and grump's countenance did not gather amiability as he sneakingly noticed the general distrust you needn't glare like that said he savagely i said it and i mean it come along youngster it's about the time i generally fry my pork and the two beauties walked away together while the crowd stared in speechless astonishment he won't make much out of that boy that's one comfort said black tom who had partially recovered from his wonder you can bet your eye teeth that his pockets won't pan out five dollars then what does he want of him queried slim sam something mean and underhand for certain said the colonel and the boy must be protected and i hereby appoint this whole crowd to keep an eye on grump and see he don't make a slave of the boy and don't rob him of dust and i reckon i'll take one of yer with me and keep watch of the old rascal to-night i don't trust him worth a dern that night the boys at the saloon wrinkled their brows like unto an impecunious committee of ways and means as they vainly endeavored to surmise why grump would want that young man as a lodger men who pursued whittling as an aid to reason made pecks of chips and shavings and were no nearer a solution than when they began there were a number of games played but so great was the absent-mindedness of the players that several hardened scamps indulged in some most unscrupulous stocking of the cards without detection but even one of these after having dealt himself both bowers and the king besides two aces suddenly imagined he had discovered grump's motive and so earnest was he in exposing that nefarious wretch that one of his opponents changed hands with him 
even the barkeeper mixed the bottles badly and on one occasion just as the boys were raising their glasses he metaphorically dashed the cup from their lips by a violent i tell you what and an unsatisfactory theory finally the colonel arose boys said he in the tone of a man whose mind is settled tain't cos the youngster looked like lively company for he didn't tain't cos grump wanted to do him a good turn for tain't his style consequently thar something wrong tom i reckon i take you along and tom and the colonel departed during the month which had elapsed since his advent grump had managed to build him a hut of the usual mining pattern and the colonel and tom stealthily examined its walls front and rear until they found crevices which would admit the muzzle of a revolver should it be necessary then they applied their eyes to the same cracks and saw the youth asleep on a pile of dead grass with grump's knapsack for a pillow and one of grump's blankets over him grump himself was sitting on a fragment of stone staring into the fire with his face in his hands he sat so long that the worthy colonel began to feel indignant to sit in a cramped position on the outside of a house for the sake of abused human nature was an action more praiseworthy than comfortable and the colonel began to feel personally aggrieved at grump's delay besides the colonel was growing thirsty suddenly grump arose looked down at the sleeping youth and then knelt beside him the colonel briskly brought his pistol to bear on him and with great satisfaction noted that tom's muzzle occupied a crack in the front walls and that he himself was out of range a slight tremor seemed to run through the sleeper and no wonder said the colonel when he recounted the adventure to the boys anybody'd shiver to have that catamount glaring at him grump arose and softly went to a corner which was hidden by the chimney gone for his knife i'll bet whispered the colonel to himself i hope tom don't spile my mad by firing fust grump returned to view but instead of a knife he bore another blanket which he gently spread over his sleeping guest then he lay down beside mix with a log of wood for a pillow the colonel withdrew his pistol and softly muttered to himself a dozen or two enormous oaths then he arose straightened out his cramped legs and started to find tom that worthy had started on a similar errand and on meeting the two stared at each other in the moonlight as blankly as a couple of well-preserved mummies s'pose the boys'll believe us whispered the colonel we can bring em down to see the show themselves if they don't replied tom the colonel's report was productive of the choicest assortment of ejaculations that had been heard in camp since natchez the leader of the vinegar gulch boys joined the church and commenced preaching the good-natured bosun was for drinking grump's health at once but the colonel demurred so did slim sam he's a goin to make em work on cheers and some hocus-pocus arrangement and he can't afford to have em get sick that's what his kindness amounts to said sam or go for his gratitude and dust when he gets any suggested another and no one repelled the insinuation it was evident however that there was but little chance of either inquest or funeral from grumps and the crowd finally dispersed with a confirmed assurance that there would be one steady cause of excitement for some time to come next morning young mick staked to claim adjoining grump the colonel led him aside bound him to secrecy and told him that there was a far richer dirt further down the stream the young man pointed toward the hut and replied he said twas payin' dirt and i ort to take his advice seein he give me a pick and shovel and pan said he'd have to get new ones anyhow thunder ejaculated the colonel more puzzled than ever knowing well how a miner will cling as long as possible to tools with which he is acquainted just wait till that boy gets a bag of dust said a miner when the colonel had narrated the second wonder the express agent'll be here next week to get what fellers wants to send to their folks the boy'll want to send some to his and his bag'll be missin' about then just wait and if my words don't come true call me a greaser the colonel pondered over the prophecy and finally determined on another vigil outside grump's hut 
meanwhile grump's pet as mix had been nicknamed afforded the camp a great deal of amusement he was not at all reserved and was easily drawn out on the subject of his protector of whom he spoke in terms of unmeasured praise by the piper that played before moses said one of the boys one day if half that boy says is true some day grump'll have wings sprout through his shirt and be sitting on the sharp edges of a cloud and playing unto a harp just like the other angels as for grump himself he improved so much that suspicion was half disarmed when one looked at him nevertheless the colonel deemed it prudent to watch the pet's landlord on the night preceding the express day the colonel timed himself by counting the games of old sledge that were played at the end of the sixth game after dark he made his way to grump's hut and quietly located himself at the same crack as before the pet and his friend were both lying down but by the light of the fire the colonel could see the eyes of the former were closed while those of the latter were wide open the moments flew by and still the two men remained in the same positions the pet apparently fast asleep and grump wide awake the interior of a miner's hut though displaying great originality of design and ingenious artistic effects becomes after a time rather a tiresome object of contemplation the colonel found it so and he relieved his strained eyes by an occasional amateur astronomical observation on turning his head with a yawn from one of these he saw inside the hut a state of affairs which caused him to feel hurriedly for his pistol grump had risen upon one elbow and was stealthily feeling with his other hand under the pet's head ha ah, thought the colonel right at last slowly grump's hand emerged from beneath the pet's head and with it came a leather bag containing gold dust the colonel drew a perfect bead on grump's temple i'll just wait till you're stowing that away my golden-haired beauty said the colonel within himself and then we'll see what cold lead's got to say about it grump untied the bag set it upon his own pillow drew forth his own pouch and untied it the colonel's aim remained true to its unconscious mark if that's the game continued the colonel to himself i reckon the proper time to play my trump is just when you're a pourin from his bag into yourn it'll be as good a theatre to bring the boys up to see how twas done lord i wish he'd hurry up grump placed a hand upon each bag and the colonel felt for his trigger grump's left hand opened wide the mouth of pet's bag and his right hand raised his own in a moment he had poured out all his own gold into pet's bag tied it and replaced it under pet's head the colonel retired quietly for a hundred yards or more then he started for the saloon like a man inspired by a three days thirst as he entered the saloon the crowd arose any feller can say i lie meekly spoke the colonel and i won't shoot i wouldn't believe it if i hadn't seen it with my own eyes grumps poured all his gold into the pet's pouch the whole party in chorus condemned their optical organs to supernatural warmth some more energetic than the rest signified that the operation should extend to their lungs and lives but the doubter of the party again spoke mind yer said he to-morrow he'll be complaining that the pet stole it and then he'll claim all in the pet's pouch the colonel looked doubtful several voices expressed dissent bosun reviving his proposition to drink to grump found opinion about equally balanced but conservative it was agreed however that all the boys should hang around the express agent next day and should if grump made the pet any trouble dispose of him promptly and give the pet a clear title to all of grump's rights and properties the agent came and one by one the boys deposited their dust saw it weighed and took their receipts presently there was a stir near the door and grump and pet entered pet's gold was weighed his mother's name given and a receipt tendered thinks he's going to have conviction in writing whispered the doubter to the colonel but the agent finished his business took the stage and departed grump started to the door to see the last of it 
the doubter was there before him and saw a big tear in the corner of each of grump's eyes a few days after grump went to placerville for a new pick for the pet the old one was too heavy for a light man grump said pet himself felt rather lonesome working on his neighbor's claim so he sauntered down the creek and got a kind word from almost every man his ridiculous anatomy had escaped the grave so long he was so industrious and so inoffensive that the boys began to have a sort of affection for the boy who had come so far to help the folks finally some weak miner unable to hold the open secret any longer told the pet about grump's operation in dust great was the astonishment of the young man and puzzling miners gained sympathy from the weak eyes and open mouth of the pet as he meandered homeward evidently as much as a loss as themselves unlucky was the spirit which prompted grump in the selection of his claim it was just beyond a small bend which the run made and was therefore out of sight of the claims of the other men belonging to the camp and it came to pass that while pet was standing on his own claim leaning on his spade and puzzling his feeble brain there came down the run the great brody chief of the jolly grasshoppers who were working several miles above mr brodie had found a nugget a few days before and in his exultation had ceased work and become a regular member of the bar a week's industrious drinking developed in him that peculiar amiability and humanity which is characteristic of cheap whisky and as pet was small ugly and alone brodie commenced working off on him his own superfluous energy poor pet's resistance only increased the fury of brodie and the family at pawkin centre seemed in imminent danger of being supported by the town when suddenly a pair of enormous stubby hands seized brodie by the throat and a harsh voice which pet joyfully recognized as grump's exclaimed let him go or i'll tear you into mincemeat curse you the chief of the jolly grasshoppers was not in the habit of obeying orders but grump's hands imparted to his command considerable moral force no sooner however had brodie extricated himself from grump's grasp than he drew his revolver and fired grump fell and the chief of the jolly grasshoppers his injured dignity made whole walked peacefully away the sound of the shot brought up all the boys from below they fit gasped the doubter catching his breath as he ran and the boy boys had to lay him out it seemed as if the doubter might be right for the boys found grump lying on the ground bleeding badly and the pet on his hands and knees how'd it come about asked the colonel of pet brody done it replied grump in a hoarse whisper he pounded the boy and i tackled him and then he fired the doubter went around and raised the dying man's head pet seemed collecting all his energies for some great effort and finally he asked what made you pour your dust into my pouch cause whispered the dying man putting one arm round pet's neck and drawing him closer cause i'm your dad give this to your mar and on pet's homely face the ugliest man at painter bar put the first token of human affection ever displayed in that neighbourhood the arm relaxed its grasp and fell loosely and the red eyes closed the experienced colonel gazed into the upturned face and gently said pet you're an orphan reverently the boys carried the dead man into his own hut several men dug a grave beside that of perkins while the colonel and doubter acted as undertakers the latter donating his only white shirt for a shroud this duty done they went to the saloon and the doubter called up the crowd the glasses filled the doubter raised his own and exclaimed boys here's corpse corpse is the best-looking man in camp and so he was for the first time in his wretched life his soul had reached his face and the judge mercifully took him while he was yet in his own image the body was placed in a rude coffin and borne to the grave on a litter of spades followed by every man in camp the colonel supporting the only family mourner each man threw a shovelful of dirt upon the coffin before the filling began 
as the last of the surface of the coffin disappeared from view pet raised a loud cry and wept bitterly at which operation he was joined by the whole party end of story fifteen story sixteen of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story sixteen wardlow's boy new boston has once been the most promising of the growing cities of the west according to some new york gentlemen who constituted a land improvement company distributed handsome maps gratis and courted susceptible eastern editors its water power was unrivalled ground for all desirable public buildings and for a handsome park with ready-grown trees and a natural lake had been securely provided for by the terms of the company's charter building material abounded the water was good the soil of unequalled fertility while the company with admirable forethought had a well-stocked store on the ground and had made arrangements to send to the town a skilful physician and a popular preacher a reasonable number of colonists found their way to the ground in the pleasant springtime and in spite of sundry local peculiarities not mentioned in the company's circular they might have remained had not a mighty freshet in june driven them away and even saved some of them the trouble of moving their houses when however most of the residences floated down the river some of them bearing their owners on their roofs such of the inhabitants as had money left the promised land for ever while the others made themselves such homes as they could in the nearest settlements which were above water and fraternized with the natives through the medium of that common bond of sympathy in the western lowlands the ague only a single one of the original inhabitants remained and he although he might have chosen the best of the abandoned houses for his residence or even the elegant but deserted company store continued to inhabit the cabin he had built upon his arrival the solid business men of the neighboring town of mount pisgah situated upon a bluff voted him a fool whenever his name was mentioned but the wives of these same men when they chanced to see old wardlow passing by with the wistful face he always wore looked after him tenderly and never lost an opportunity to speak to him kindly when they met at tea-parties or quilting bees or sewing societies or in other gatherings exclusively feminine there were not a few of them who had the courage to say that the world would be better if more men were like old wardlow for love seemed the sole motive of old wardlow's life the cemetery which the thoughtful projectors of new boston had presented to the inhabitants had for its only occupant the wife of old wardlow and she had been conveyed thereto by a husband who was both young and handsome the freshet which had soon afterward swept the town had carried with it wardlow's only child a boy of seven years who had been playing in a boat which he in some way unloosed from that day the father had found no trace of his child yet he never ceased hoping for his return every steamboat captain on the river knew the old man and the roughest of them had cheerfully replied in the affirmative when asked if they wouldn't bring up a small boy who might some day come on board report himself as stevie wardlow and ask to be taken to new boston almost every steamboat man from captain and pilot down to firemen and roustabout carried and posted wardlow's circulars wherever they went up red river the yazoo the white the arkansas the missouri and all the smaller tributaries of the mississippi new boston had long been dropped from the list of post towns but every crossroad for miles around had a fingerboard showing the direction and telling the distance to new boston upon a tall cottonwood tree on the river bank and nearly in front of wardlow's residence was an immense signboard bearing the name of new boston landing and on the other side of the river at a ferry staging belonging to a crossing whose other terminus was a mile further down the river was a sign which informed travellers that persons wishing to go to new boston would find a skiff marked wardlow tied near the staging 
the old man never went to mount pisgah for stores or up the river to fish or even into his own cornfield and garden without affixing to his door a placard telling where he had gone and when he would return when he went to the cemetery which he frequently did a statement to that effect and a plan showing the route to and through the cemetery was always appended to his door and as he could never clearly imagine his boy as having passed the childhood in which he had last seen him all the signboards placards and circulars were in large capital letters even when the river overflowed its banks which it did nearly every spring the old man did not leave his house he would not have another story built upon it as he was advised to do lest stevie might fail to recognize it on his return but after careful study he had the house raised until the foundation was above high water mark and then had the ground made higher but sloped so gradually that the boy could not notice the change when one after another of the city's plots upon which deserted houses stood were sold for default in payment of taxes old wardlow bought them himself they always went for a song and the old man preferred to own them lest some one else might destroy the ruins and thus make the place unfamiliar to the returning wanderer of friends he had almost none although he was intelligent industrious ingenious and owned a library which passed for quite a large one in those days and in the new west he cared to talk on only one subject and as that was of no particular interest to other people and became in the course of time extremely stale to those who did not like it the people of mount pisgah and the adjoining country did not spend more time upon old wardlow than was required by the necessities of business there were a few exceptions to this rule old mrs perry who passed for a saint and whose life did not belie her reputation used to drive her old pony up to new boston about once a month carrying some home-made delicacy with her and chatting sympathetically for an hour or two among the mount pisgah merchants there was one who had never had a child of his own who always pressed the old man's hand warmly and admitted the possibility of whatever new hope wardlow might express the pastors of the several churches at mount pisgah however much they disagreed on doctrinal points were in perfect accord as to the beauty of a character which was so completely under the control of a noble principle that had no promise of money in it most of them therefore paid the old man professional visits from which they generally returned with more benefit than they had conferred time had rolled on as usual in spite of wardlow's great sorrow the mexican war was just breaking out when new boston was settled and wardlow's hair was black and mount pisgah was a little cluster of log huts but when lincoln was elected wardlow had been gray and called old for nearly ten years and mount pisgah had quite a number of two-story residences and brick stores and was a county town with courthouse and jail all complete none of the railway lines projected toward and through mount pisgah had been completed however nor had the town telegraphic communication with anywhere so compared with localities enjoying the higher benefits of civilization mount pisgah and its surroundings constituted quite a paradise for horse thieves there were still sparsely settled places too which needed the ministrations of the methodist circuit rider the young man who had been sent by the southern illinois conference to preach the word on the mount pisgah circuit was great-hearted and impetuous and tremendously in earnest in all that he did or said but like all such men he paid the penalty of being in advance of his day and generation by suffering some terrible fits of depression over the small results of his labor and so following the example of most of his predecessors on the mount pisgah circuit he paid many a visit to old wardlow to learn strength from this perfect example of patient faith as the circuit rider left the old man one evening and sought his faithful horse in the deserted barn in which he had tied him he was somewhat astonished to find the horse unloosed and another man quietly leading him away 
courage and decision being among the qualities which are natural to the successful circuit rider he sprang at the thief and knocked him down the operator in horse flesh speedily regained his feet however and as he closed with the preacher the latter saw under the starlight the gleam of a knife commending himself to the lord he made such vigorous efforts for the safety of his body that within two or three moments he had the thief face downward on the ground his own knee on the thief's back one hand upon the thief's neck and in his other hand the thief's knife then the circuit rider delivered a short address my sinful friend said he when two men get into such a scrape as this and one of them is in your line of business one or the other will have to die and i don't propose to be the one i haven't finished the work which the master has given me to do if you've any dying messages to send to anybody i give you my word as a preacher that they shall be delivered but you must speak quick what's your name i'll give you five hundred dollars to let me off you may holler for help and tie my hand and no use speak quick hissed the preacher what's your name stephen wardlow gasped the thief what roared the preacher loosening his grasp but instantly tightening it again stephen wardlow replied the thief but i haven't got any message to send to anybody i haven't a relative in the world and nobody would care if i was dead i might as well go now as any time it's square when you do let me have it that's all where's your parents asked the preacher dead i reckon the thief answered leastways i know mother is and dad lived in a fever and agerish place and i s'pose he's gone too before this where did he live i don't know some new settlement somewheres in illinois i got lost in the river when i was a little boy and was picked up by a tradin boat and sold for a nearly white nigger i s'pose i was pretty dark there was a silence the captive lay perfectly quiet as if expecting the fatal blow suddenly a voice was heard not wishin to interfere in a fair fight it's me parson sheriff peters not wishin to interfere in a fair fight i've been a-lookin on here where i'd tracked the thief myself and would a grabbed him if you hadn't been about half a minute ahead of me and if you want to know my honest opinion my professional opinion it's just this there was stuff for a splendid sheriff spiled when you went a-preachin how you'd get along when it come to collectin taxes i don't know never havin been at any meetin where you took up a collection but when it come to an arrest you'd be just chain lightnin ground down to a pat the prisoner's yours and so's all the rewards that's offered for em though they're not offered for a man of the name he gives but honest now don't you think there's a chance of mitigatin circumstances in his case let's talk it over i'll help you tie him so he can't slip you the sheriff lighted a pocket lantern and placed it in a window frame behind him then he tied the prisoner's feet and legs in several places tied his hands behind his back sat him upon the ground with his face toward the door cocked a pistol and then beckoned the preacher toward a corner the sheriff opened his pocket-book and took out a paper whispering as he did so i've carried this as a sort of curiosity but it may come in handy now let's see uh, confound it the poor old fellow is describing the child just as it was fifteen years ago oh here's a point or two brown eyes black hair oh bully here's the best thing yet first joint of the left forefinger gone the sheriff snatched the light and both men hastened to examine the prisoner's hand after a single glance their eyes met and each set of optics inquired of the other at length the sheriff remarked he's your prisoner the circuit rider flushed and then turned pale he took the lantern from the sheriff turned the light full on the prisoner's face and said prisoner suppose you were to find that your father was alive the horse thief replied with a piercing glance which was full of wonder but said not a word a moment or two passed and the preacher said suppose you were to find that your father was alive and had searched everywhere for you and that he thought of nothing but you and was all the time hoping for your return that he had grown old before his time all because of his longing and sorrow for you the thief dropped his eyes and then his face twitched at last he burst out crying 
your father is alive he isn't far from this cabin he's very sick i've just left him nothing but the sight of you will do him any good but i think so much of him that i'd rather kill you this instant than let him know what business you've been in them's my sentiments too remarked the sheriff let me see him exclaimed the prisoner clasping and raising his manacled hands while his face filled with an earnestness which was literally terrible let me see him if it's only for a few minutes you needn't be afraid that i'll tell him what i am and you won't be mean enough to do it if i don't try to run away have mercy on me you don't know what it is to never have had anybody to love you and then suddenly to find that there is some one that wants you the preacher turned to the officer and said i'm a law-abiding citizen sheriff and the sheriff replied he's your prisoner then suppose i let him go on his promise to stick to his father for the rest of his life he's your prisoner repeated the sheriff suppose then i were to insist upon your taking him into custody why then said the sheriff speaking like a man in the depths of meditation i would let him go myself and i'd have to shoot you to save my reputation as a faithful officer the preacher made a peculiar face the prisoner exclaimed hurry you brutes the preacher said at last ah, let him loose the sheriff removed the handcuffs dived into his own pocket brought out a pocket comb and glass and handed them to the thief then he placed the lantern in front of him and said fix yourself up a little your hat's a miserable one i'll swap with you you've got to make up some cock and bull story now for the old man'll want to know everything you might say you've been a sheriff down south somewhere since you got away from the feller that owned you the preacher paused over a knot in one of the cords on the prisoner's legs and said say you were a circuit rider that's more near the literal truth the sheriff seemed to demur somewhat and he said at length without meaning any disrespect parson don't you think twould tickle the old man and the citizens more to think he'd been a sheriff they wouldn't dare to ask him so many questions then either and it might be unhandy for him if he was asked to preach while a smart horse thief has naturally got some of the pints of a real sheriff about him you insist upon it that he's my prisoner said the preacher tugging away at his knot and i insist upon the circuit rider story and continued the young man with one mighty pull at the knot he's got to be a circuit rider and i'm going to make one of him do you hear that young man i'm the man that's setting you free and giving you to your father you can make anything you please out of me said the prisoner only hurry as you say parson remarked the sheriff with admirable meekness he's your prisoner but i could make a splendid deputy out of him if you'd let him take my advice and i'd agree to work for his nomination for my place when my term runs out think of what he might get to be there has sheriffs gone to the legislature and i've heard of one that went to congress circuit riders get higher than that sometimes said the preacher leading his prisoner toward old wardlow's cabin they get as high as heaven oh remarked the sheriff and gave up the contest both men accompanied the prisoner toward his father's house the preacher began to deliver some cautionary remarks but the young man burst from him threw open the door and shouted father the old man started from his bed shaded his eyes and exclaimed stevie the father and son embraced seeing which the sheriff proved that even sheriffs are human by snatching the circuit rider in his arms and giving him a mighty hug the father recovered and lived happily the son and the preacher fulfilled their respective promises and the sheriff always on meeting either of them so abounded in genial winks and effusive handshakings that he nearly lost his next selection by being suspected of having become religious himself End of story sixteen story seventeen of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story seventeen tom chafflin's luck luck why i never seed anything like it you might give him the sweepings of a saloon to watch and he'd pan out a nugget every time do it as sure as shootin 
this rather emphatic speech proceeded one day from the lips of cairo jake an industrious washer of the golden sands of california but it was evident to all intelligent observers that even language so strong as to seem almost figurative did not fully express cairo jack's conviction for he shook his head so positively that his hat fell off into the stream which found a level only an inch or two below jacob's boot tops and he stamped his right foot so vigorously as to endanger his equilibrium well cited a discontented miner from new jersey providence knows his own business best i suppose but i could have found him a feller that could have made a darn sight better use of his good luck if he'd had any than tom chafflin he don't know nothing about the worth of money never seed him drunk in my life and he don't seem to get no fun out of cards providence have a season's job of satisfying you old red bank replied cairo jack but it's all fired queer for all that if a fellow could only learn how he done it twouldn't seem so funny but it don't seem to have no way in particular about him that a feller can find out fact said red bank with a solemn groan i've studied his face why if i'd studied half as hard at school i'd be a president or a missionary or something now but i don't make it out once i lowed twas cause he don't keer and was kind of reckless sort of went it blind so i tried it on a play in monte well how did it work asked the gentleman from cairo work echoed the jerseyman with the air of an unsuccessful candidate musing over the saddest words of thought or pen i started with thirteen ounces and in twenty minutes i was borrowing the price of a drink from the dealer that's how it worked certain other miners looked sorrowful it was evident that they too had been reckless and had trusted to luck and that in a place where gold digging and gambling were the only two means of proving the correctness of their theory it was not difficult to imagine by which one they were disappointed long and short of it's just this resumed cairo jack straightening himself for a moment and picking some coarse gravel from his pan tom chafflin's always in luck his claim pays better than anybody else's he always gets the lucky number in a raffle his shovel don't never break and his chimbley ain't always a catchin a fire he's gone down to frisco now and i'll bet a dozen ounces that just cause he's aboard the old boat'll go down and back without runnin aground a solitary durn time no one took up cairo jack's bet so that it was evident he uttered the general sentiment of the mining camp of quicksilver bar every man in the temporary silence which followed jake's summary again bent industriously over his pan until the scene suggested an amateur water-cure establishment returning thanks for basins of gruel when suddenly the whole line was startled into suspension of labor by the appearance of london george who was waving his hat with one hand and a red silk handkerchief with the other while with his left foot he was performing certain a pas not necessary to successful pedestrianism quicksilver boy ain't up to snuff oh no ain't a catchin up with frisco not at all little chestnut don't know how to run a saloon and make others shop sweep not in the least not at all oh no huh inquired half a dozen don't believe me if you don't want to but just bet against it for you go to see that's all continued london george fanning himself with his hat george said judge baggs with considerable asperity if you are an englishman try to speak your native tongue and explain what you mean by actin as if you just broke out of a lunatic asylum speak quick or i'll find you drinks for the crowd just as leave you would remarked the unabashed briton seeing uh, seeing chestnut's got a, a female a woman a lady cashier there guess them san francisco saloons ain't the only ones that knows what's what not any i don't believe a word of it said the judge washing his hands rather hastily but i'll just see for myself cairo jack looked thoughtfully on the retreating form of the judge and remarked he'll feel ashamed of hisself when he gets there and finds he'll have to drink alone reckon i'll go up just to keep him from feeling bad several others seemed impressed by the same idea and moved quite briskly in the direction of chestnut saloon 
the judge protected by his age and a pair of green spectacles boldly entered while his followers dispersed themselves sheepishly just outside the open door past which they marched and remarched as industriously as a lot of special sentries there was no doubt about it chestnut had installed a lady at the end of the bar and as between breakfast and dinner there was but little business done at the saloon the lady was amusing herself by weighing corks and pebbles in the tiny scales which were to weigh the metallic equivalent for refreshments the judge contemplated the arrangements with considerable satisfaction and immediately called up all thirsty souls present those outside the door entered with the caution of veterans in an enemy's country and with a bashfulness that was painful to contemplate they stood before the bar they glanced cautiously to the right and gently inclined their heads backward until only a line of eyes and noses were visible from the cashier's desk then the judge raised his green glasses a moment and smiled benignantly on the new cashier as he raised his liquor aloft then he turned to his party and they drank the toast as solemnly as if they were the soldiers of miles standish fortifying the inner man against fear of the pequods then they separated into small groups and conversed gravely on subjects in which they had not the slightest interest while each one pretended not to look toward the cashier and each one saw what the others were earnestly striving to do but when the judge settled the score and chatted for several minutes with the receiver of treasure and the lady young and rather pretty and quite pleasant and modest and business-like laughed merrily at something the judge said an idea gradually dawned upon the bystanders and within a few moments the boys feverishly awaited their chances to treat the crowd for the sole purpose of having an excuse to speak to the new cashier and to stand within three feet of her for about the space of a minute great was the excitement on the creek when the party returned and testified to the entire accuracy of london george's report every one went to the saloon that night there had been some games arranged to take place at certain huts but they were postponed by mutual consent even the domine an ex-preacher who had never yet set foot upon the profane floor of the saloon appeared there that evening in search of some one so exceeding hard to find that the domine was compelled to make several tours of all the tables and benches in the room chestnut himself when questioned said she had come by the way of the isthmus with her father and mother who had both died of the chagres fever before reaching san francisco that some friends of her family and his had been trying to get her something to do in frisco and that he had engaged her at an ounce a day and furthermore that he would be greatly obliged if the boys at quicksilver wouldn't marry her before she had worked out her passage money from frisco which he had advanced but the boys at quicksilver were not so thoughtful of chestnut's interests as they might have been they began to buy blacking and neckties and white shirts and to patronize the barber no one had any opportunity for love-making for the ladies working hours were all spent in public and in a business which caused frequent interruptions of even the most agreeable conversation it soon became understood that certain men had proposed and been declined and betting on who would finally capture the lady was the most popular excitement in camp cool-headed betting men watched closely the countenance of sunrise as some effusive miner had named the new cashier as each man approached to pay in his coin or dust and though they were intensely disgusted by its revelations they unhesitatingly offered two to one that domine would be the fortunate man to be sure she saw less of the domine than of any one else for though he did not drink or pay for the liquor consumed by any one else he occasionally came in to get a large coin changed and then it was noticed that sunrise regarded him with a sort of earnestness which she never exhibited toward any one else too bad sighed cairo jack somebody ought to tell her that he's only a preacher and she'll only throw herself away if she takes him if any stranger was to insult her domine wouldn't be man enough to draw on him beats thunder though sighed red bank how them preachers can take folks in 
thar's chestnut himself he's took with dominie stead of ordered him out he talks with him and her just as if he'd as leave get rid of her as not boats a comin shouted cairo jack looking toward the place half a mile below where the creek emptied into the river see her smoke like nuff tom chafflin on board he was a-goin to try to come back by the first boat and of course he's done it jest his luck if he'd only come sooner somebody besides the preacher would have got her you can just bet your bottom ounce on it let's go down and see if he's got any news several miners dropped tools and pans and followed jake to the landing and gave a hearty welcome to tom chafflin he certainly looked like anything but a lucky man he was good-looking and seemed smart but his face wore a dismal expression which seemed decidedly out of place on the countenance of a habitually lucky man things ain't gone right tom asked cairo jack never went worse declared tom gloomily guess i'll sell out and try my luck somewheres else ef you'd only come a little sooner sighed jake you'd have had a chance that would have made everything seem to go right till judgment day i'll show you jake opened the saloon door and there sat sunrise as bright modest and pleasant-looking as ever with the air of a man who has conferred a great benefit and is calmly awaiting his rightful reward jake turned to tom but his expression speedily changed to one of hopeless wonder and then to one of delight as tom chafflin walked rapidly up to the cashier's desk pushed the domine one side and the little scales the other and gave sunrise several very hearty kisses to which the lady didn't make the slightest objection in fact she blushed deeply and seemed very happy that's what i went to frisco to look for explained tom to the staring bystander but i couldn't find out a word about her don't wonder you looked glum then said cairo jack but but it's just your luck dominie here was going down to hurry you back said sunrise but but we'll give him a different job now my dear said tom completing the sentence and they did end of story seventeen story eighteen of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story eighteen old twitchett's treasure old twitchett was in a very bad way he must have been in a bad way for crocky the extremely mean storekeeper at bender had given up his own bed to twitchett and when crocky was moved with sympathy for any one it was a sure sign that the object of his commiseration was going to soon stake a perpetual claim in a distant land whose very streets we are told are of precious metal and whose walls and gates are of rare and beautiful stones it was twitch's own fault the boy said with much sorrowful profanity when they abandoned black peter gulch to the chinese and located at bender twitchett should have come along with the crowd instead of staying there by himself in such an unsociable way perhaps he preferred the society of rattlesnakes and horny toads to that of high-toned civilized beings there was no accounting for taste but then he should have remembered that all the rattlesnakes in the valley couldn't have raised a single dose of quinine between them and that the most sociable horny toad in the world and the most obliging one couldn't fry a sick man's pork or make his coffee but then twitchett was queer they agreed he always was queer he kept himself so much apart from the crowd that until to-night when the boys were excited about him few had ever noticed that he was a white-haired delicate young man instead of a decrepit old one and that the twitching of his lips was rather touching than comical at any rate it was good for twitchett that two old residents of black peter gulch had ignorant of the abandonment of the camp revisited it and accidentally found him insensible yet alive on the floor of his hut they had taken turns in carrying him for he was wasted and light until they reached crocky's store and when they laid him down while they should drink the proprietor of the establishment so said a pessimist in the camp 
seeing that his presence while he lived and until he was buried would attract trade and increase the demand for drinks insisted on putting twitchett between the proprietary blankets twitchett had rallied a little thanks to some of crockey's best brandy but it was evident to those who saw him that when he left crockey's he would be entirely unconscious of the fact suddenly twitchett seemed to realize as much himself and to imagine that his exit might be made very soon for he asked for the men who brought him in and motioned to them to kneel beside him i'm very grateful boys for your kindness i wish i could reward you but haven't got anything i've got nothing at all the only treasure i had i buried buried it in the hut when i thought i was going to die alone i didn't want those heathens to touch it i put it in a can i wish you'd get it and it's a dying man's last request take it and if twitchett finished his remark it was heard only by auditors in some locality yet unvisited by sam baker and boylston smith who still knelt beside the dead man's face and with averted eyes listened for the remainder of twitchett's last sentence slowly they comprehended that twitchett was in a condition which according to a faithful proverb effectually precluded the telling of tales then they gazed solemnly into each other's faces and each man placed his dexter forefinger upon his lips then boylston smith whispered virtue is its own reward eh sam you bet whispered mr baker in reply it's on the square now between us square as a die whispered boylston when'll we go for it asked sam baker can't go till after the funeral virtuously whispered boylston twould be mighty ungrateful to go back on the corpse that's made our fortunes fact remarked mr baker holding near the nostrils of old twitchett a pocket mirror he had been polishing on his sleeve after a few seconds he examined the mirror and whispered nary a sign might as well tell the boys the announcement of twitchett's death was the signal for an animated discussion and considerable betting how much dust he had washed and what he had done with it seeing that he neither drank nor gambled was the sole theme of discussion there was no debate on the deceased religious evidences no distribution of black crape no tearful beating down of the undertaker these accessories of a civilized deathbed were all scornfully disregarded by the bearded men who had feelingly drank to twitch its good luck in whatever world he had gone to but when it came to deceased gold his money the bystanders exhibited an interest which was one of those touches of nature which certifies the universal kinship each man knew all about twitchett's money though no two agreed he had hid it he had been unlucky and had not found much he had slyly sent it home he had wasted it by sending it east for lottery tickets which always drew blanks he had been supporting a benevolent institution old deacon baggs mildly suggested that perhaps he only washed out such gold as he actually needed to purchase eatables with but the boys smiled derisively they didn't like to laugh at the deacon's gray hairs but he was queer old twitchett was buried and sam baker and boylston smith reverently uncovered with the rest of the boys while deacon baggs made an extempore prayer but for the remainder of the day old twitchett's administrators foamed restlessly about and watched each other narrowly and listened to the conversation of every group of men who seemed to be talking with any spirit they kept a sharp eye on the trail to black peter gulch lest some unscrupulous miner should suspect the truth and constitute himself sole legatee but when the shades of evening had gathered and a few round drinks had stimulated the citizens to more spirited discussion sam and boylston strode rapidly out on the black peter gulch trail to obtain the reward of virtue he didn't say what kind of a can it was remarked mr baker after the outskirts of bender had been left behind just what i thought replied boylston pity we couldn't have lasted long enough for us to have asked him but i've been a-workin some sums about different kinds of cans i learned how from phipps this afternoon he's been to college and his head's crammed full of such puzzlin things it took multiplyin with four figures to get the answer but i couldn't take a peaceful drink 
till i knowed something about how the find would pan out well inquired mr baker anathematizing a stone over which he had just stumbled well replied boylston stopping in an exasperating manner to light his pipe the smallest can of goin is a half pound powder can and that'll hold over two thousand dollars worth and even that wouldn't be bad for a single night's work eh just so responded mr baker then there's oyster cans and meat cans yes said boylston and the smallest of em's good for ten thousand if it's full and when you come to five pound powders why one of em would make two fellers rich they passed quickly and quietly through greenhorn's bar the diggings at the bar were very rich and experienced poker players such as were twitchett's executors had made snug little sums in a single night out of the innocent countrymen who had located at the bar but what were the chances of the most brilliant game to the splendid certainty which lay before them they reached black peter gulch and found twitchett's hut still unoccupied save by a solitary rattlesnake whose warning scared them not mr baker carefully covered the single window with his coat and then boylston lit a candle and examined the clay floor there were several little depressions in its surface and in each of these boylston vigorously drove his pick while mr baker stood outside alternately looking out for would-be disturbers and looking in through a crack in the door to see that his partner should not in case he found the can absent-mindedly spill some of the contents into his own pocket before he made a formal division boylston stopped a moment for breath leaned on his pick stroked his yellow beard thoughtfully and offered to bet that it would be an oyster can mr baker whispered through the crack that he would take that bet and made it an ounce boylston again bent to the labor which while it wearied his body seemed to excite his imagination for he paused long enough to bet that it would be a five-pound powder can and mr baker again willing to fortify himself against possible loss accepted the bet in ounces suddenly boylston's pick brought to light something yellow and round something the size of an oyster can and wrapped in a piece of oilskin you've won one bet whispered mr baker who was inside before the yellow package had ceased rolling across the floor not if this is it growled boylston it don't weigh more than an ounce can wrapper and all might as well see what tis though the two men approached the candle hastily tore off the oilskin and carefully shook the contents from the can the contents proved to be a small package labelled my only treasures boylston mentioned the name of the arch adversary of souls while mr baker with a well-directed blow of his heel reduced the can from a cylindrical form to one not easily described by any geometric term unwrapping the package mr baker discovered a picture case which when opened disclosed the features of a handsome young lady while from the wrappings fell a small envelope which seemed distended in the middle gold in that maybe suggested boylston picking it up and opening it it was gold fine yellow and brilliant but not the sort of gold the dead man's friends were seeking for it was a ringlet of hair sadly mr baker put on his coat careless of the light which streamed through the window slowly and sorely they wended their way homeward wrathfully they bemoaned their wasted time as they passed by the auriferous slumberers of greenhorn's bar depressing was the general nature of their conversation yet they were human in spite of their disappointment for as old deacon baggs who was an early riser strolled out in the gray dawn for a quiet season of meditation he saw boylston smith filling up a little hole he had made on top of old twitchett's grave and putting the dirt down very tenderly with his hands End of story eighteen story nineteen of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain 
story nineteen blizzer's wife the mining camp of tough case though small had its excitements as well as did many camps of half a dozen saloon power and on the first day of november eighteen fifty it was convulsed by the crisis of by far the greatest excitement it had ever enjoyed it was not a lucky find for some of the largest nuggets in the state had been taken out at tough case it was not a grand spree for all sprees at tough case were grand and they took place every sunday it was not a fight for when the average of fully developed fights fell below one a fortnight some patriotic citizen would improvise one that the honour of his village should not suffer no all these promoters of delicious and refreshing tumult were as nothing to the agitation which commencing three months before had increased and taken firmer hold of all hearts at tough case until to-day it had reached its culmination blizzer's wife had come out and was to reach camp by that day's boat since blizzer had first announced his expectation every man in camp had been secretly preparing for the event but to-day all secrecy was at an end and white shirts standing collars new pants black hats polished boots combs brushes and razors and even hair oil and white handkerchiefs so transformed the tremulous miners that a smart detective would have been puzzled in looking for any particular citizen of tough case even old hatchet jaw whose nickname correctly indicated the moral import of his countenance sheepishly gave musu the old frenchman an ounce of gold dust for an hour's labor bestowed on hatchjaw's self-asserting red hair bets as to what she looked like were numerous and as no one had the slightest knowledge on the subject experienced bettists made handsome fortunes in betting against every description which was backed by money for each man had so long pondered over the subject that his ideal portrait seemed to him absolutely correct and an amateur phrenologist who had carefully studied blizzer's cranium and the usually accepted laws of affinity consistently bet his last ounce his pistol hut frying-pan blankets and even a pack of cards in a tolerable state of preservation sailors college men pikes farmers clerks loafers and sentimentalists stood in front of sim ripson's store and stared their eyes into watery redness in vain attempts to hurry the boat a bet of drinks for the crowd lost by the non-arrival of the boat on time was just being paid when sim ripson whose bar window commanded the river exclaimed she's comin many were the heel taps left in glasses as the crowd hurried to the door numerous were the stealthy glances bestowed on shirt cuffs and fingernails and bootlegs crosstree a dandyish young sailor hung back to regard himself in a small fragment of looking-glass he carried in his pocket but was rebuked for his vanity by stumbling over the door-sill an operation which finally resulted in his nose being laid up in ordinary the little steamer neared the landing whistled shrilly snorted defiantly buried her nose in the muddy bank in front of the store and shoved out a plank several red-shirted strangers got off but no one noticed them at any other time so large an addition to the population of tough case would have justified an extra spree sundry barrels were rolled out but not even old guzzle inspected the brand barrels and bags of onions and potatoes were stacked on the bank but though the camp was sadly in need of vegetables no one expressed becoming exultation all eyes were fixed on the steamer end of the gangplank and every heart beat wildly as blizzer appeared leading a figure displaying only the top of a big bonnet and a blanket shawl hanging on one arm they stepped on the gangplank they reached the shore and then the figure raised its head and dropped the shawl thunder ejaculated fourteenth street and immediately retired and drank himself into a deplorable condition 
the remaining observers dispersed respectfully but the reckless manner in which they wandered through mud puddles and climbed over barrels and potato sacks indicated plainly that their disappointment had been severe after another liquid bet had been paid and while sleeves but lately tenderly protected were carelessly drawing damp moustaches an old miner remarked reckon that's why he left the states and the emphatic you bet which followed his words showed that the tough caseites were unanimous in the subject of mrs blizzard for she was short and fat and had a pug nose and a cast in one eye her forehead was low and square her hair was of a colour which seemed fugitive as the paper makers say her hands were large and pudgy her feet afforded broad foundations for the structure above them and her gait was not suggestive of any popular style besides she seemed ten years older than her husband who was not yet thirty for several days boots were allowed to grow rusty and chins unshaven as the boys gradually drank and worked themselves into a dumb forgetfulness of their lately cherished ideals but one evening during a temporary lull in the conversation at sim ripson's old uncle ben an ex-deacon of a new hampshire church lifted up his voice and remarked pears to me blizzard's beginning to look scrumptious he used to be the shabbiest man in camp through the open door the boys saw blizzard carrying a pail of water and the water carrying in the american manner is not an especially graceful performance blizzard certainly looked unusually neat pallet who had spoiled many canvases and paint brushes in the east attentively studied blizzard in detail and found his hair was combed his shirt buttoned at the collar and his trousers lacking the california soil which always adorns the seat and knees of orthodox mining pantaloons it's her as did it said pat fadden and tain't all she's done fat do you think she did this mornin i was a-fixin me pork just as every other by in camp allers does and just then who should come along but herself i took off me pork and commenced me breakfast when says she to me says she you don't ate it without gravy do you gravy is it says i nobody ever heard of gravy here says i then it's toime says she and she poured off the fat and scrumbled a bit of cracker in the pan and put in some water and when i thought the old thing would blow up for the steam it made she poured the gravy on me plate yes she did there were but a few men at tough gates who were not willing to have their daily fare improved and as mrs blizzard did not make a tour of instruction the boys made it convenient to stand near mrs blizzard's own fire and see the mysteries of cooking as a natural consequence sam ripson began to have inquiries for articles he had never heard of much less sold and he found a hurried trip to frisco was an actual business necessity as several miners took their departure after one of these culinary lessons arkansas bill with a mysterious air took fourteenth street aside forty said he in a most appealing tone can you see what twas about she kept a lookin at my left hand all the time as if she thought there was somethin the matter with it maybe she thought i was tuckin biscuits up my sleeves like kids in a live game can you see anythin the matter with that paw the aristocratic young reprobate gave the hand a critical glance and replied perhaps she thought you didn't know what buttons and buttonholes were made for thunder exclaimed the miner with an expression of countenance which archimedes might have worn when he made his famous discovery from that day forward the gentleman from arkansas instituted a rigid buttonhole inspection before venturing from his hut besides purchasing a share in a new clothes broom pears to me i don't see blizzard playin' cards with you fellers as much as it was remarked uncle ben one evening at the store no said flip the champion euchre player with a sad face and strong oath he used to lose his ounces like a man but t'other night i knocked at his door and asked him to come down and have a hand he didn't say nothin but she up and said he'd stopped playin i really took it to be my duty to argue with her and show her how tough it was to cut off a feller's enjoyment but she said twas too high-priced for the fun it fetched 
that ain't the worst nother said top jack flipp's usual partner there was arkansas bill and jerry villa that used to be as fond of their little game as anybody now every night they go up thar to blizzards and just do nothing but sit around and talk it's enough to make a marble statue cuss to see good men spiled that way something astonishing about what comes of it though resumed the deacon twas only yesterday that bill was carrying a bucket of dirt to the crick and just says he got there his foot slipped and he would kerplosh knowing bill's language and such occasions ain't what a church member art to hear i was making it convenient to leave when along come her and he choked off as sudden as a feller on the gallers day by day the boys dug dirt and carried it to the creek and washed out the precious gold day by day the denizens of tough case worked as many hours and as industriously as men anywhere but no tough case site was so wicked as to work on sunday sunday at tough case commenced at sunset on saturday after the good old puritan fashion and lasted through until working time on monday morning but beyond this matter of time the puritan parallel could not be pursued for on sunday was transacted all the irregular business of the week on sunday was done all the hard drinking and heavy gambling and on sunday were settled such personal difficulties as were superior to the limited time and low liquor pressure of the week the evening sun of the first saturday of mrs blizzard's residence at tough case considered his day's work done and retired under the snowy coverlets the sierras lent him the tired miners gladly dropped pick shovel and pan but bedclothing was an article which at that moment they scorned to consider there was important business and entertainment which would postpone sleep for many hours the express would be along in the morning and no prudent man could sleep peaceably until he had deposited his gold dust in the company's strong box then there were two or three old feuds which might come to a head they always did on sunday and above all red wing a man with enormous red whiskers had been threatening all week to have back the money flip had won from him on the preceding sunday and red wing had been very lucky in his claim all week and the two men were very nearly matched and were magnificent players so the game promised to last many hours and afford handsome opportunities for outside betting sim ripson understood his business by sunset he had all his bottles freshly filled and all his empty boxes distributed about the room for seats and twice as many candles lighted as usual and the card tables reinforced by some upturned barrels he also had a neat little woodpile under the bar to serve as a barricade against stray shots the boys dropped in pleasantly two or three at a time and drank merrily with each other and the two or three who were not drinking men sauntered in to compare notes with the others there were no aristocrats or paupers at tough case nor any cliques whatever the men were at home here they were equal and sim ripson's was the general gathering place for everybody but in the course of two or three hours there was a perceptible change of the general tone at sim ripson's it was so every saturday night or sunday morning old hatchet jaw said it was because sim ripson's liquor wasn't good moosu the frenchman maintained it was due to the absence of chivalrous spirit crosstree the sailor said it was always so with landsmen fourteenth street privately confided to several that twas because there was no good blood in camp the amateur phrenologist ascribed it to an undue cerebral circulation and uncle ben the deacon insisted upon it that the fiend personally was the disturbing element probably all of them were right for it seemed impossible that the sunday excitements at sim ripson's could proceed from any single cause their proportions were too magnificent drinking singing swearing gambling and fighting the tough case sites made night so hideous that uncle ben spent half the night in earnest prayer for these misguided men and the remainder of it in trying to make up his mind to start for home but by far the greater number of the boys on that particular night surrounded the table at which sat red wing and flip 
both were playing their best and as honestly as each was compelled to do by his adversary's watchfulness each had several times accused the other of cheating each had his revolver at his right hand and the crowd about them had the double pleasure of betting on the game and on which would shoot first suddenly red wing arose as flip played an ace on his adversary's last card and raked the dust toward himself you took that ace out of your sleeve i seed you do it give me back my ounces said red wing it's a lie roared the great flip springing to his feet and seizing red wing's pistol arm the weapon fell and both men clutched like tigers sim ribson leaped over the bar and separated them no rasslin here said he when gentlemen gets two men to hold in and shoots at sight i have to stand it but rasslin's vulgar you'll have to go out of doors to do it i'll have it out with him with pistols then cried red wing picking up his weapon greed roared flip whose pistol lay on the table we'll do it across the crick at daylight it's daylight now said sim ripson hurriedly after looking out of his window at the end of the bar he was a good storekeeper was sim ripson and he knew how to mix drinks but he had an unconquerable aversion to washing blood stains out of the floor the two gamblers rushed out of the door pistols in hand and the crowd followed each man talking at the top of his voice and betting on the chances of the combatants suddenly above all the noise they heard a cracked soprano voice singing with some unauthorized flatting and sharping another six days work is done another sabbath is begun return my soul enjoy thy rest improve the day that god hath blessed red wing stopped and dropped his head to one side as if expecting more flip stopped everybody did arkansas bill whose good habits had been laid aside late saturday afternoon exclaimed well i'll be blowed bill didn't mean anything of the sort but the tone in which he said it expressed precisely the feeling of the crowd the voice was again heard oh that our thoughts and thanks may rise as grateful incense to the skies and draw from heaven that sweet repose which none but he that feels it knows red wing turned abruptly on his heel keep the ounces said he there's an old woman to hum that thinks a sight of me i reckon myself i'm good for something besides fillin a hole in the ground that night sim ripson complained that it had been the poorest sunday he had ever had at tough case the boys drank but it was a sort of nerveless unbusinesslike way that sim ripson greatly regretted and very few bets were settled in sim ripson's principal stock in trade when sim finally learned the cause of his trouble he promptly announced his intention of converting mrs blizzer to common sense and as he had argued uncle ben first into a perfect frenzy and then into silence the crowd considered mrs blizzer's faith doomed monday morning bright and early as men with aching heads were taking their morning bitters mrs blizzer appeared at sim ribson's store and purchased a bar of soap boys heard you singin yesterday said sim yes inquired mrs blizzard yes all of em delighted said sim gallantly but you don't believe in no such stuff i s'pose do you what stuff asked mrs blizzard why about heaven and hell and the bible and all them things do you know what the greek for hell meant and do you know the bible's all the time contradictin itself i can show you i tell you what i do know mr ribson said the woman i know some things in my heart that no mortal being never told me and they couldn't be skeered out by all the dictionaries and commentators a-goin that's what i know and mrs blizzard departed while the astonished theologian sheepishly admitted that he owed drinks to the crowd while the ex-deacon uncle ben was trying to determine to go home he found quite a pretty nugget that settled his mind and he announced that same night at the store that all his mining property was for sale as he was going back east i'll go with you uncle ben said fourteenth street the crowd was astounded 
men of fourteenth street's caliber seldom had pluck enough to go to the mines and their getting away or their doing anything that required manliness was of still more unfrequent occurrence i know it said the young man translating the glances which met his eye you fellows think i don't amount to much anyway perhaps i don't i came out here because i fell out with a girl i thought i loved she acted like a fool and i made up my mind all women were fools but that wife of blizzards has shown me more about true womanliness than all the girls i ever knew and i'm going back to try it over again one morning a small crowd of early drinkers at sim ripson's dropped their glasses yet did not go briskly out to work as usual in fact they even hung aloof in a most ungentlemanly manner from jerry miller who had just stood treat and both these departures from the usual custom indicated that something unusual was the matter finally top jack remarked he's a stranger and typhus is a bad thing to have around but something ought to be done for him tain't the thing to ax for volunteer for it's danger without no chance of pleasing excitement we might throw kids around one to each feller in the camp and him as gets ace of spades is to tend to the poor cuss i think jerry ought to go himself argued flip he's been exposed already by looking into the feller's shanty and probably hurt as best as he's going to be i might go said sim ripson who in his character of barkeeper had to sustain a reputation for bravery and public spirit but wouldn't do to shut up the store you know and especially the bar nobody'd stand it needn't trouble yourselves said arkansas bill who had entered during the conversation she's thar thunder exclaimed top jack frowning and then looking sheepish yes continued bill she stopped me as i was coming along and said she just heerd of it and was a goin i told her there was men enough in camp to look out for him but she said she reckoned she could do it best wants some things from frisco though and i'm a goin for em and arkansas bill departed while the men at sim ripson's sneaked guiltily down to the creek for many days the boys hung about the camp's single street every morning unwilling to go to work until they had seen mrs blizzer appear in front of the sick man's hut the boys took turns at carrying water making fires and serving mrs blizzer generally and even paid handsomely for the chance one morning mrs blizzer failed to appear at the usual hour the boys walked about nervously they smoked many pipes and took hurried drinks and yet she did not appear the boys looked suggestingly at her husband and he himself appeared to be anxious but being one of the shiftless kind he found anxiety far easier than action suddenly arkansas bill remarked i can't stand it any longer and walked rapidly toward the sick man's hut and knocked lightly on the door and looked in there lay the sick man his eyes partly open and on the ground apparently asleep and with a very purple face lay mrs blizzer do something for her gasped the sick man give her a chance for god's sake i don't know how long i've been here but i kind of woke up last night as if i'd been asleep she was a-standin lookin in my eyes and had a hand on my cheek i believe it's turned says she still a-lookin after a bit she says it's turned sure and all of a sudden she tumbled i couldn't holler i wish to god i could arkansas bill opened the door and called blizzer and the crowd followed blizzer though at a respectful distance in a moment blizzer reappeared with his wife no longer fat in his arms and arkansas bill hurried on to open blizzer's door the crowd halted and didn't know what to do until musu the little frenchman lifted his hat upon which every man promptly uncovered his head a moment later arkansas bill was on sim ribson's horse and galloping off for a doctor and sim ribson who had always threatened sudden death to any one touching his beloved animal saw him and refrained even from profanity the doctor came and the boys crowded the door to hear what he had to say hm said the doctor a rough miner himself new arrival been fat worn out rainy season just coming on not much chance no business to come to california ought to have had sense enough to stay home look a here doctor said arkansas bill indignantly she's got this way a nursin a fella stranger too that every man in camp was afeard to go nigh 
is that so asked the doctor in a tone considerably softened then she shall get well if my whole time and attention can bring it about the sick woman lay in a burning fever for days and the boys industriously drank her health and bet heavy odds on her recovery no singing was allowed anywhere in camp and when an old feud broke out afresh between two miners and they drew their pistols a committee was appointed to conduct them at least two miles from camp before allowing them to shoot the sundays were allowed to pass in the commonplace quietness peculiar to the rest of the week and men who were unable to forgo their regular weekly spree were compelled to emigrate sim ripson though admitting that the change was decidedly injurious to his business declared that he would cheerfully be ruined in business rather than have that woman disturbed he was even heard to say that though of course there was no such place as heaven there ought to be for such woman one evening as the crowd were quietly drinking and betting arkansas bill suddenly opened the door of the store and cried she's mendin the fever's broke Shh! my treat boys said sim ribson hurrying glasses and favorite bottles on the bar the boys were just clinking glasses with blizzer himself who during his wife's absence and illness had drifted back to the store when arkansas bill again opened the door she's a sinkin all of a sudden he gasped blizzer you're wanted the two men hurried away and the crowd poured out of the store by the light of a fire in front of the hut in which the sick woman lay they saw blizzer enter and arkansas bill remain outside the hut near the door the boys stood on one foot put their hands into their pockets and took them out again snapped their fingers looked at each other as if they wanted to talk about something that they couldn't suddenly the doctor emerged from the hut and said something to arkansas bill and the boys saw arkansas bill put both hands up to his face then the boys knew that their sympathy could help blizzard's wife no longer slowly the crowd re-entered the store and mechanically picked up the yet untasted glasses sim ripson filled a glass for himself looked a second at the crowd and dropping his eyes raised them again looked as if he had something to say looked intently into his glass as if espying some irregularity looked up again and exclaimed boys it's no use maybe there's no hell maybe the bible contradicts itself but but there is a heaven or such folks would never get their just dues here's to blizzard's wife the best man in camp and may the lord send us somebody like her in silence and with uncovered heads was the toast drunk and for many days did the boys mourn for her whose advent brought them such disappointment end of story nineteen Story twenty of Romance of California Life by John Haberton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story twenty A Boarding House Romance. I keep a boarding house. If any fair proportion of my readers were likely to be members of my own profession, I should expect the above announcement to call forth more sympathetic handkerchiefs than have waved in unison for many a day. But I don't expect anything of the sort i know my business too well to suppose for a moment that any boarding-house proprietor no matter how full her rooms or how good pay her boarders are ever finds time to read a story even if they did they'd be so lost in wonder at one of themselves finding time to write a story that they'd forget the whole plot and point of the thing i can't help it though i must tell about poor dear mrs perry even if i run the risk of cook's overdoing the beef so that mr bluff who is english and the best of pay can't get the rare cut he loves so well mrs perry's story has run in my head so long that it has made me forget to take change from the grocer at least once to my knowledge and even made me lose a good boarder by showing a room before the bed was made up they say that poets get things out of their heads by writing them down and i don't know why boarding-house keepers can't do the same thing it's about three months since mrs perry came here to board i'm very sure about the time and it was the day i was to pay my quarter's rent and to-morrow will be quarter-day again thank the lord i've got the money ready 
i didn't have the money ready then though and the landlord left his temper behind him instead of a receipt and i was just having a little cry in my apron and asking the lord why it was that a poor lone woman who was working her finger ends off should have such a hard time when the doorbell rang that's the landlord again i know his ways the mean wretch said i to myself hastily rubbing my eyes dry and making up before the mirror in the hat tree as fierce a face as i could then i snatched open the door and tried to make believe my heart wasn't in my mouth but the landlord wasn't there and i've always been a little sorry for i was looking so savage that a wee little woman who was at the door trembled all over and started to go down the steps don't go ma'am i said very quickly with the best smile i could put on and i think i've been long enough in the business to give the right kind of a smile to a person that looks like a new boarder don't go i thought it was i thought it was uh, somebody else that rang come in do she looked as if i was doing her a great honour and i thought that looked like poor pay but i was too glad at not having the landlord just then to care if i did lose one week's board besides she didn't look as if she could eat much i see you advertise a small bedroom to let said she looking appealing like as if she was going to beat me down on the strength of being poor how much is it a week eight dollars said i rather shortly seven dollars was all i expected to get but i put on one so as to be beaten down without losing anything i can get eight from a single gentleman the only objection being that he wants to keep a dog in the back yard oh i'll pay it said she quickly taking out her pocket-book i'll take it for six weeks anyhow i never felt so ashamed of myself in my life i made up my mind to read a penitential passage of scripture as soon as i closed the bargain with her but remembering the book says to be reconciled to your brother before laying your gift on the altar i says quick as i could for fear that if i thought over it again i couldn't be honest you shall have it for seven my dear madam if you're going to stay so long and i'll do your washing without extra charge this last i said to punish myself for suspecting an innocent little lady oh thank you thank you very much said she and then she began to cry i knew that wasn't for effect for we were already agreed on terms and she had her pocket book open showing more money than i ever have at a time unless it's rent day she tried to stop crying by burying her face in her hands and it made her look so much smaller and so pitiful that i picked her right up as if she was a baby and kissed her then she cried harder and i a woman over forty too couldn't find anything better to do than to cry with her i knew her whole story within five minutes knew it perfectly well before i'd fairly shown her the room and got it aired they were from the west and had been married about a year she hadn't a relative in the world but his folks had friends in philadelphia so he'd got a place as clerk in a big clothing factory at twelve hundred dollars a year they'd been keeping house just as cosy as could be in four rooms and were as happy as anybody in the world when one night he didn't come home she was almost frantic about him all night long and first thing in the morning she was at the factory she waited until all the clerks got there but george his name was george perry didn't come the proprietor was a good-hearted man and went with her to the police office and they telegraphed all over the city but there didn't seem to be any such man found dead or drunk or arrested for anything she hadn't heard a word from him since her husband's family's friends were rich the stuck-up brutes but they seemed to be annoyed by her coming so often to ask if there wasn't any other way of looking for him so she like the modest frightened little thing she was stayed away from them then somebody told her that new york was the place everybody went to so she sold all her furniture and pawned almost all her clothes and came to new york with about fifty dollars in her pocket what i'll do when that's gone i don't know said she commencing to cry again unless i find george i won't live on you though ma'am she said lifting her face up quickly out of her handkerchief i won't indeed i'll go to the poorhouse first but 
and then she cried worse than before and i cried too and took her in my arms and called her a poor little thing and told her she shouldn't go to any poor house but should stay with me and be my daughter i don't know how i came to say it for goodness knows i find it hard enough to keep out of the poor house myself but i did say it and i meant it too her things were all in a little valise and she soon had the room to rights and when i went up again in a few minutes to carry her a cup of tea she pointed to her husband's picture which she had hung on the wall and asked me if i didn't think he was very handsome i said yes but i'm glad she looked at the tea instead of me for i believe she'd seen by my face that i didn't like her george the fact is men look very differently to their wives or sweethearts than they do to older people and to boarding-house keepers there was nothing vicious about george perry's face but if he'd been a boarder of mine i'd have insisted on my board promptly not for fear of his trying to cheat me but because if he saw anything else he wanted he'd spend his money without thinking of what he owed i felt so certain that he'd got into some mischief or trouble and was afraid or ashamed to come back to his wife that i risked the price of three ribs of prime roasting beef in the following personal advertisement george p your wife don't know anything about it and is dying to see you answer through personals but no answer came and his wife grew more and more poorly and i couldn't help seeing what was the matter with her then her money ran out and she talked of going away but i wouldn't hear of it i just took her to my own room which was the back parlor and told her she wasn't to think again of going away that she was to be my daughter and i would be her mother until she found george again i was afraid for her sake that it meant we were to be with each other forever for there was no sign of george she wrote to his family in the west but they hadn't heard anything from him or about him and they took pains not to invite her there or even to say anything about giving her a helping hand there was only one thing left to do and that was to pray and pray i did more constantly and earnestly than i ever did before although the good lord knows there have been times about quarter day when i haven't kept much peace before the throne finally one day mrs perry was taken unusually bad and the doctor had to be sent for in a hurry we were in her room the doctor and mrs perry and i i was endeavouring to comfort and strengthen the poor thing when the servant knocked and said a lady and gentleman had come to look at rooms i didn't dare to lose boarders for i'd had three empty rooms for a month so i hurried into the parlour i was almost knocked down for a second for the gentleman was george perry and no mistake if the picture his wife had was to be trusted in a second more i was cooler and clear-headed than i ever was in my life before i felt more like an angel of the lord than a boarding-house keeper kate said i to the servant show the lady all the rooms kate stared for i'd never trusted her or any other girl with such important work and she knew it she went though followed by the lady who though she seemed a weak silly sort of thing i hated with all my might then i turned quickly and said don't you want a room for your wife too george perry he stared at me a moment and then turned pale and looked confused then he tried to rally himself and he said you seem to know me ma'am yes said i and i know mrs perry too and if ever a woman needed her husband she does now even if her husband is a rascal he tried to be angry but he couldn't he walked up and down the room once or twice his face twitching all the time and then he said a word or two at a time i wish i could poor girl oh for god forgive me what can i do i wish i was dead you wouldn't be any use to anybody then but the evil one george perry and you're not ready to see him just yet said i just then there came a low long groan from the back room and at the same time some one came into the parlour i was too excited to notice who it was and george perry when he heard the groan stopped short and exclaimed good god who's that your wife said i almost ready to scream i was so wrought up he hid his face in his hands and trembled all over there was half a minute's silence it seemed half an hour and then we heard a long thin wail from a voice that hadn't ever been heard on earth before 
what's that said perry in a hoarse whisper his eyes starting out of his head and hands thrown up your baby just born said i will you take rooms for your family now george perry i asked i shan't stand in the way said a voice behind me i turned around quickly just in time to see with her eyes full of tears the woman who had come with george go out the door and shut the hall door behind her thank god said george dropping on his knees amen said i hurrying out of the parlor and locking the door behind me i thought if he wanted to pray while on his knees he shouldn't be disturbed while if he should suddenly be tempted to follow his late companion i shouldn't be held at the judgment day for any share of the guilt i found the doctor bustling about getting ready to go and mrs perry looking very peaceful and happy with a little bundle hugged up close to her i guess the lord will bring him now said mrs perry if it's only to see his little boy like enough my dear said i thanking the lord for opening the question for my wits were all gone by this time and i hadn't any more idea of what to do than the man in the moon but said i he won't bring him till you're well and able to bear the excitement oh i could bear it any time now said she very calmly it would seem just as natural as would be to have him come in and kiss me and see his baby and bless it would it i asked with my heart all in a dance well trust the lord to do just what's right i hurried out and opened the parlor door there stood george perry changed so i hardly knew him he seemed years older his thick lips seemed to have suddenly grown thin and were pressed tightly together and there was such an appealing look from his eyes be very careful now i whispered you may see them she expects you and don't imagine anything has gone wrong i took him into the room and she looked up with a face like that i hope the angels have i didn't see anything more for my eyes filled up all of a sudden so i hurried upstairs to an empty room and spent half an hour crying and thanking the lord there was a pretty to-do at the dinner-table that day i'd intended to have souffle for dessert and i always make my own souffles but i forgot everything but the perrys and the boarders grumbled awfully i didn't care though i was too happy to feel abused i don't know how george perry explained his absence to his wife perhaps he hasn't done it at all but i know she seems to be the happiest woman alive and that he don't seem to care for anything in the world but his wife and baby as to the woman who came with him to look at a room i haven't seen her since but if she happens to read this story she may have the consolation of knowing that there's an old woman who remembers her one good deed and prays for her often and earnestly End of story twenty